a perfect shot. The photographer holds up his camera, focusing on the deer. Then, the creature turns and stares down the photographer with the face of a human man. A long, elegant neck ending in a mutated abomination. The photographer drops the camera and runs away, screaming. He won't be coming back to get it. He'd rather just buy a new one. A woman is walking her dog along the dirt road she's walked down every day for several years. It winds alongside a dense forest and past several large plots of land. Some are occupied by farms, some have been left abandoned. It's a pleasant walk, one she can always count on to be as quiet and peaceful as it is stimulating for her dog, with plenty to look at and smell. Occasionally he gets distracted by a wild animal, but the odd squirrel or possum is nothing the dog hasn't seen before, and she can quickly get him back on the path with a whistle and a tug of his leash. As the two of them near a familiar bend toward the halfway point of the walk, she can't help but notice that something seems off about the dog's behavior today. His steps are anxious, and his hackles are up. He keeps sniffing the air, tugging at the leash, whining insistently, as if trying to tell her something. She soothes the dog, promising him that there's nothing over there. The area he keeps staring at, a low growl rumbling in his chest, is an abandoned farm. No one's been over there for years, but no matter what she does, he keeps staring at that abandoned farm in the distance. Suddenly there's a rustling sound, some sort of unseen animal moving through the bushes toward the farm. The noise sets the dog off, and he jolts in its direction, yanking so hard and so abruptly on the leash that it flies out of his owner's hand. Free to pursue whatever had been aggravating him so much, the dog tears off toward the abandoned farm. The woman chases after him, desperate to catch her beloved pet before he gets himself attacked by a wild animal or worse. She sprints after the dog for half a mile until they've passed the ruins of an old barn and reached a horse paddock that seems to be in surprisingly good condition. As the woman catches her breath, she spots a sign she'd never noticed before on the road. It reads, The Miracle Farm. The paint is unchipped, vivid, even fresh. This doesn't look abandoned. Her dog barks sharply, and she follows the sound. There he is, crouched low to the ground, shaking and barking at a pair of horses. Wait, huh? no, those aren't horses. They have the hooves, the haunches, the tails, but their upper bodies are all human torso, arms, head, and face. It shouldn't be possible, but her dog is barking at what appears to be a pair of centaurs. She grabs hold of his leash, urging him back from the strange beasts. As she backs away, she hears a sound behind her, like a person imitating the crow of a rooster. She spins around and sees a wide-eyed man with a bright red wattle on his face, feathers jutting out of his neck. He crows again, then stoops to peck at the ground. Just behind the rooster man, she sees even more impossible human-animal hybrids. Rotund, pink-fleshed children with pig noses roll in a puddle of mud. A woman coiled up on a rock stares straight ahead, forked tongue flitting in and out of her mouth as she hisses. This place isn't abandoned after all. There is still a farm here, but it's no ordinary farm. The woman scoops her dog, her completely ordinary non-human dog, into her arms and sprints back toward the dirt road. She keeps going, running all the way home until she can get to a phone and immediately calls the authorities. The first few people she speaks to laugh at her, accusing her of making a prank call, but one man takes her seriously and records her report. Then he passes it on to his friends at the SCP Foundation. They conduct a raid of the Miracle Farm and find that it is just as bizarre as the woman described. They uncover files in their office detailing that the property once belonged to Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited, before its ownership passed to a private company that specializes in the finest in custom-ordered pets, prey, and companions. Mobile Task Force Theta-2, Moreau's Morgue, is deployed to the scene, where they bring all on-hand personnel, clients, and living specimens into custody. Personnel and clients are questioned, then given Class A amnestics and released. The specimens are contained for further study and the facility is destroyed. But not before the MTF discovers a curious marble statue acting as a fountainhead, providing all drinking water for the animal-human hybrids on site. The statue, depicting the Roman goddess Venus, allows water to flow out of its mouth when pumped in through the base. Somehow, water flowing through it is causing ordinary animals to transform into these bizarre creations. But how? Before we tell you, First, I have a question directly for you. Is something interfering with your happiness? 
or preventing you from achieving your goals. Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who's going through a hard time, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible, and this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Bob. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Bob. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. And now back to the strange marble statue. The fountain is quickly removed from the area and brought to the foundation for further study. And that is the story of how the SCP Foundation got its hands on SCP-1575. As is frequently the case at the SCP Foundation, the research team quickly began conducting controlled experiments using SCP-1575. They exposed a variety of animal test subjects to water that had passed through the fountainhead. I combed through the test logs I was able to access and have compiled some of the most relevant examples of the anomaly's effects on various subjects. I must warn you that some of the imagery contained within may be a bit disturbing, even by SCP Foundation standards. I admit that a few of them turned my significantly desensitized stomach, but still, they fascinate me, and like a train wreck in slow motion, I haven't been able to look away. Test 1575-2 was performed on a female Japanese field mouse, Apodemus argentius, at the adolescent stage of development. After several weeks of exposure to SCP-1575-1, the mouse began to rapidly increase in size. Over the course of 12 days, the mouse grew to a height of 1.01 meters, a 500% increase in overall body size. As the mouse began to grow, her fur falling out and being replaced with smooth, human skin, her face warping into that of a young human woman, her appetite increased drastically. She was provided a standard field mouse diet of fruits, berries, and nuts, and consumed nearly 95% of her body weight at a given time in this provided food. By the twelfth day of her mutation, the mouse's heart was unable to support her rapidly growing body, and it gave out. She died due to failure of her cardiovascular system, leaving behind an eerie half-mouse, half-human creature with a vestigial tail, partially transformed paws, and gray-tinged skin where her fur had once been. Test 1575-4's subject was a pre-adolescent male white-tailed deer, Otocoileus virginianus. The deer began to mutate fairly quickly following exposure to the water, and its initial steps were an alarming sight, to say the least. He began to suffer severe hemorrhaging in the pelvic area as his reproductive organs atrophied. By the end of the mutation cycle, they had disappeared entirely, leaving a smooth, fleshy surface behind. Several male researchers in attendance had to leave the room during the initial bleeding, and one asked to be referred to an on-site counselor regarding a persistent, recurring nightmare inspired by the mutation. The deer's arms and legs changed into human arms and legs, hooves into hands and feet. By the end of the process, which stabilized after 30 days, the deer had become an androgynous-looking eastern seaboard Native American person. The only remaining indicators that this had once been something other than human were a tail and antler nubs resembling those characteristic of yearling bucks. After testing the anomaly on prey animals, the researchers decided to explore its effects on a predator. The subject of Test 1575-6 was an adult female Bengal tiger, Panthera tigris tigris. Naturally, there were concerns about the safety of researchers given the subject's aggressive nature. To prevent any accidental injury or death, she was kept sedated for the duration of any hands-on examination. Unfortunately, the application of these sedatives had a negative impact on the tiger's health during the mutation process. After four days, before any dramatic visible transformation had even taken place, 
the tiger experienced failure of the heart, liver, and kidneys. Though this experiment was largely regarded as a failure, it provided the team with a vital piece of information. Sedatives should not be used on test subjects until they were further along in their transformation and at least 80% stabilized. After the tiger, the research team pivoted to the least threatening version of a similar animal, an adolescent female domestic cat, Felis catus. The transformation occurred without incident over the course of 30 days. It was described as unsettling to watch, especially coupled with the pained yowls of the subject, which slowly transformed into the screams of a young woman. But the subject survived the process. Her body stretched and contorted, claws turned to long, pointed fingernails, whiskers fell out, and fur was completely shed. By the time her transformation was complete, there was a young woman in the containment chamber, crawling around on all fours and batting at particles of dust. She retained her tail, the aforementioned pointed nails, and eyes with the same vertical slit pupils she had as a feline. She spoke several times, but only to request additional food. After testing on a cat, the next natural step was to test the anomaly on a dog. For test 1575-9, the subject was an adult female domestic canine, Canis lupus familiaris, of mixed breed. At this point in time, it was believed that the fountainhead had no anomalous effect on invertebrates. Unfortunately, this experiment proved otherwise. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The dog was exposed to the anomalous water, and dramatic signs of mutation soon began to show. First, the dog began shedding all of its fur. At this point, the researchers got an unfortunate look at something that had been hiding in the dog's coat, an infestation of fleas, which were beginning to transform as well. The fleas had quadrupled in size and were continuing to grow. Even more horrifying, their legs had changed into appendages resembling human fingers, and their features rearranged into a nightmarish facsimile of a human face, blood pouring from their open mouths. Unfortunately for the test subject and any researchers present, the fleas were not the only parasite that had infested this dog. On the sixth day of the experiment, the slowly mutating dog collapsed on her side, breathing heavily, exhibiting intense discomfort. Her abdomen began to distend, and nearby researchers could see something… wriggling just beneath the skin. The motion became more violent, and the abdomen distended further and further, as if the dog was progressing through the stages of pregnancy at an advanced rate. One of the researchers made an anxious comment about being reminded of a particular scene from the movie Alien and was admonished for it. But he was quickly proven right, because with a sudden burst, a tapeworm with the face of a man erupted through the skin, screaming at the top of its lungs, eyes rolling wildly in its sockets. One researcher vomited, another fainted. The experiment was swiftly aborted, and testing procedures were updated to include a specification that all subjects must be examined for parasites prior to any exposure to SCP-1575. None of the mutated creatures survived this test. The dog test was a colossal failure on many counts, but it inspired the research team to continue testing on non-mammals, not invertebrates, no one wanted to go down that road again, but other animals at least. For test 1575-12, the subject was a pre-adolescent female hyacinth macaw, Anadorhynchus hyacinthinus. The parrot swiftly began to change, and the sound of agonized paws filled the room, along with a sickening snapping sound. After a moment, the sound was identified as breaking bones. The rest of the bird's body, particularly the muscles and organs, were transforming at a faster pace than the skeleton. The body contorted painfully, and the wings began to split, forming into rudimentary fingers and hands. But the transformation never finished, never stabilized. After 20 days, the macaw was dead, and the cause of death was determined to be internal injuries due to these extensive bone fractures. The subject of test 1575-13 was an adult female leopard gecko, Eublepharus macularius. The transformation occurred at an accelerated rate, and within one week, the lizard had grown to a height of approximately four feet and displayed many human characteristics, including human legs and feet, a face, and a full head of hair. The hands remained unchanged, though they were larger, and the specimen was still capable of climbing up walls, much like an ordinary gecko. At the 10-day mark, the subject experienced catastrophic organ failure as a result of the mutation and expired. One more test on an invertebrate was conducted, this time deliberately. 
For test 1575-14, the subject was a female common green grasshopper, Homocestus viridulus. As the mutation began, the grasshopper began to shed its exoskeleton in a process best described as flesh forcing its way out of a casing, breaking the exoskeleton into pieces. What was left following this shedding process was a creature resembling the same grasshopper, but three times larger and covered in human skin. It continued to grow, but no further human features seemed to develop. After 15 days, it expired. An autopsy revealed the development of human organs inside, including a heart, lungs, kidneys, and liver. The cause of death could not be determined, but the transformation process is thought to have made the subject incompatible with life. The subject of Test 1575-15 was an adult female grizzly bear, Ursus arctos horribilis. During the first 29 days of her mutation, the bear did not consume any food or drink aside from SCP-1575-1. Still, she did not appear to experience any hunger or discomfort aside from the pain of the transformation itself. Her body slowly shrank over the course of 30 days, her fur thinning until it left only the ordinary amount of body hair for an average human woman. Notably, the hair was the same color as the fur she had once had. She retained her bear paws, which appeared to be uncomfortably heavy at the ends of her new human arms. Throughout the transformation, stool samples taken from the subject showed excessive amounts of organic matter, such as blood and fatty deposits. After 32 days, the mutation was complete, and the former bear's condition was stable. She did not speak. Instead, she used her newly transformed mouth and voice to grunt and roar. It was much less intimidating coming out of her human mouth, but researchers noted that her paws and claws were still dangerous and should be avoided. The subject of Test 1575-16 was an adolescent female gravy zebra, also imperial zebra, Equus grevii. Over the course of 27 days, the zebra's main body, hind legs, and most of her head mutated into a human, resembling the appearance of a person native to Africa. However, her front legs and jaw structure remained that of a zebra. The transformation stabilized, leaving her in this half-changed state. She was unable to move without pain, unable to eat, and exhibited extreme distress at her state of existence. When she attempted to walk, she would lose her balance and topple over, lying on the ground in agony. It is uncertain what caused the transformation to halt at such an incomplete stage, but the subject's quality of life had been all but destroyed. After a thorough physical examination, the half-transformed zebra specimen was euthanized as a humane measure. As disturbing as the results of the Foundation's test using SCP-1575 were, they allowed for a more thorough understanding of the anomaly and how it operates. The statue, which was studied extensively, shows no anomalous properties on its own, nor do any samples taken of the marble throw up any red flags. It appeared to be a completely ordinary statue, except for the effect that it has on any water that flows through it. This water, or SCP-1575-1, begins to show its anomalous true colors when consumed by a non-human mammal. Non-human mammals who consume 0.5 or more liters of this water per day will begin to mutate over the course of a month. Perplexingly, impossibly, they will mutate into a human being. During the experiments, it was noted that the ethnicity of the resulting human seems to correspond with the humans native to the natural habitat of the pre-transformation mammal. A European deer displays Caucasian features, for example, while a North American deer resembles a Native American. Domestic dogs and cats have ethnically ambiguous features or appear mixed race, likely due to the mixed backgrounds of their species. Many of the survivors of this process develop vocal cords and are able to speak about their experiences, but their odds of surviving are not great. Female specimens have about a 25% fatality rate. Males have a staggering fatality rate of about 95%. There is a 40% chance that the transformed animal, regardless of sex, will keep at least one premutation feature. These include, but are not limited to, paws, tails, ears, and fur. Across the board, those who survive the mutation process describe it as extremely painful. Though these transformed animals can communicate, they tend to display an intelligence level that aligns with their prior species. There are a few exceptions to this, as some subjects have displayed heightened problem-solving skills, but it is uncertain what exactly caused this shift. Proposed causes include neural restructuring during mutation or an unintended byproduct of the Foundation testing itself. These transformed instances do not magically become human in behavior, personality, or habits, 
They retain their animal instincts, memories, and sense of self, give or take some added depression or anxiety brought on by the traumatic and drastic changes they've endured. Humans exposed to this anomalous water do not seem to change at all, which makes a degree of sense. If the water serves to transform mammals into human beings, then a human drinking it has nothing for the water to change. Still, I wouldn't suggest drinking it. Tap water may not taste great, but it's far less likely to mutate you. SCP-1575 is currently held in a 6 meter by 6 meter by 4 meter containment chamber at Biosite 23, with direct access to Research Laboratory 3 at the same site. Unless it is actively in use for an approved test, no water may be allowed into SCP-1575's containment. After testing has concluded, all water used during the test is to be held in quarantine and may only be used for further tests. At the time of my reading, I discovered one addendum added to the file for SCP-1575 by a doctor assigned to the anomaly. It reads, Following the incident on the 12th of this month, during test 1575-9, any animal to be used in testing with SCP-1575 is to be thoroughly examined for both external and internal parasites. Our initial beliefs that SCP-1575-1 only affected the primary host has proven wrong. It apparently retains its mutagenic properties, even when ingested secondarily through the host's lower GI tract or bloodstream. We absolutely do not need another instance of half-mutated flea creatures, and the psychologist is having a hard time helping Janet with her nightmares of a seven-foot-long tapeworm with a screaming face tearing out of the belly of a dog. I fear that Janet and I may have those nightmares in common. This imagery will stay with me for quite some time. When it comes to drinking water from mysterious fountains, proceed with caution, my friends. Sure, this particular fountainhead may not trigger mutation in humans, but that doesn't mean it's the only one of its kind out there. Drink from the wrong water spout, and you may find yourself changed, and no one, including me, can predict what you might become. Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently, your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me. It can't be that bad, reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture, though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible, and as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. They have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around, but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you, and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you, and turn again. Hello? Is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond, and... You scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. 
take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park. The detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks, slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred milky white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which you can see is completely covered in a hard white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away. He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910, but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910 and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially, or perhaps entirely, out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victims' mouths. Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance, comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin, which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability, causing them to act as a vector for the effect who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary, though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure, though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. 
unfortunately for the victim. Should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings, and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary, due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading, and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee so there's no risk 
Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something, to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps he can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. 
At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but, as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. 
After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88. With D14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flattest were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. 
Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. A young researcher is thrown against the wall so hard that his spine breaks. A man turned into a scarecrow. A woman unmoored from gravity. A man losing a vital component of his brain. All these poisoned prizes can be yours if you have your hands on a certain special object. The thief is confused, to say the least, at the sight before him. It isn't exactly what he has been expecting to find on his travel to the Forgotten Cave. The strange object is displayed on an altar, with a beam emanating from somewhere above, shining a bright column of moonlight onto it. This must be the treasure that he was sent here for. But what was this strange treasure? He's still aching all over from his long journey, many days and nights spent crossing the desert just to reach his destination. All around the cavern are precious stones and gold coins, jewelry and riches beyond the thief's wildest dreams, and it's all his for the taking. Just as long as he fulfills his promise to the strange, decrepit old man he met at the entrance of the cave. The thief steps closer to the altar and examines the object the old man told him to recover. Upon hearing the word, lamp, the thief had been picturing an ornate oil jug with a handle and spout, not this thing. The thief had never seen an object quite like it. It's a tall, thin neck that winds upwards from a flat, circular base. The top looks like the hem of a dress, but far smaller and made from green glass. It's a lamp, all right, but not as this thief would know it. He lifts it up to get a closer look and notices something, an empty space beneath the stained glass lampshade. It looks like there's a part missing. Nearby, he comes across another curiosity, a rounded, almost perfect sphere of glass with an elongated protrusion terminating in a metal connector. It seems like it would be the perfect fit for the vacant port on the lamp. So, figuring out how to affix the two, the thief attaches the light bulb to the lamp. To his surprise, the bulb begins to glow a light blue. Cautiously, he places it back down and backs away, uncertain about what is about to happen next. A sudden plume of blue smoke erupts from the lamp, and the thief ducks for cover, thinking the object has exploded. But there's no loud sound, no flames, and this prompts him to peek out from his hiding place to see a mysterious figure emerging from the cloud. It looks to be an older man, hovering above the ground, not legs, but a tail of the same smoke as the rest of his body. Now the thief recognizes what's going on. He's grown up with stories of creatures almost exactly like this one, and it fills him with a rush of excitement. It's a genie. He can remember as clear as day tales about genies. They are mystical wish-givers, imprisoned within lamps and then bound to the person who discovers them. Once it emerges from its slumber, a genie will then offer whoever freed it three wishes. Hey, you there! You gonna hide all night? Come on, kid, let's get this over with. What'll it be? The genie asks rather brashly. The thief approaches the smoky, translucent figure and immediately knows exactly what to do. He's already thought of exactly what to ask for, the wish that can free him from his life of stealing and poverty. Genie, I wish for you to make me rich, he says. As soon as he's finished his sentence, the genie vanishes, leaving the thief confused. Surely he still had another two wishes. 
He's startled as the light bulb he had affixed to the lamp suddenly explodes, for real this time, with a spark and a shower of small glass shards. Before the thief can so much as call for the genie to return and demand that it explain itself, he feels a sickly churning in his stomach. Something is very, very wrong. After a few short moments of violent and painful sickness, the thief lays dead on the floor of the cavern. If one from a more advanced period of history were to examine him, they'd find the thief's body exposed to an extremely large overdose of vitamin C, enough to kill him. The genie had made him rich. It just goes to show the old warning to be careful what you wish for is always applicable, especially when you find yourself making a wish from SCP-4035. Although it might look like an unassuming table lamp from the outside, within it stored an ancient entity who also happens to be wildly unpredictable and a bit of a jerk, to be completely honest. Anyone examining SCP-4035 will notice the first odd thing about it fairly quickly. The lamp itself is rather unremarkable, composed of a simple iron base with a conical lampshade above. Its patterned stained glass sports a number of shades of green, and overall, it looks like the type of lamp you might find at a grandparent's house, or a distant elderly relative who always tells you just how much you've grown when you visit every five to ten years, and whose home decor hasn't changed since the mid-1970s. But the first of SCP-4035's many strange properties is that it doesn't actually seem to work. Closer inspection of the lamp itself will reveal that it doesn't actually have any electrical components whatsoever. There's no wiring running through it, no cable leading to a plug that can be affixed to a wall socket, no switch, nothing. Except for a standard light bulb socket. So naturally, anyone coming across this seemingly useless table lamp will feel compelled to find a light bulb and see if the thing actually works. That's when things get even stranger. Light bulbs placed into SCP-4035 will indeed illuminate, despite the lack of electricity powering the lamp. There won't appear to be anything unusual about its functionality at first, other than the bulbs inserted into SCP-4035 will produce a blue-tinted light. But surely that's just because of its ornate stained glass lampshade, right? Wrong. Shortly after placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, that's when he emerges. Who is he? Well, the Foundation knows him as SCP-4035-1, but for the sake of brevity, let's just call him the Genie. Emerging from the lamp will be an entity that seems to be gaseous in its composition, lacking a tangible, physical form, and instead appearing to be incorporeal, almost like a ghost, or a man made of vapors. This being has been described as having the characteristics of a middle-aged, balding man, looking to be somewhere between his 40s and 50s. Whenever he appears, the genie always looks the same, always sporting a patchy brown suit coat. Beneath, however, he has no visible legs, and in their place is a cloud of blue gas that emanates from the lower body of SCP-4035-1. As soon as SCP-4035-1 appears, he will strike up a conversation with whoever placed a light bulb in the lamp that contains him. Now, you might be forgiven for, perhaps, predicting how the next interaction typically plays out. After all, you've seen Aladdin. A genie appears and offers to grant the person who discovered its lamp three wishes. However, the person making the wishes has to be very careful with how they word their requests to the magical entity. One wrong word, and they might find themselves suffering some unforeseen consequences. Or perhaps it unfolds like other myths and fables involving genies. The wishes are granted, but they come at a terrible, maybe even fatal, price. Well, you'd be almost right to expect something like that from this genie. But let's just say that SCP-4035-1 doesn't exactly enjoy doing things by the book. The genie introduces itself, usually under some randomly selected false name. Some favorites of his during past encounters have included Bobby, Spiff, Danny Fry, and Josephi Krakowski. Now you can see why just calling him the genie is a lot simpler. Anyway, after he manifests, SCP-4035-1 won't offer three wishes, but instead offers to sell a product to whoever placed a light bulb in SCP-4035. Attempts to ask the genie to elaborate on the product being offered are usually met with an evasive response and little detail being revealed. Once the person or subject talking to SCP-4035-1 responds, the genie then, in effect, grants their wish. They can just be trying to converse with the entity, but it will regard even a completely unrelated verbal response as an answer. 
The subjects typically receive a biological modification or other anomalous ability that directly relates to what they said to the genie. And we do mean directly. Once again, you might be forgiven for expecting that being granted supernatural powers by a magical genie would be a fun experience. After all, who doesn't want anomalous abilities? But be warned, the abilities SCP-4035-1 hands out usually fit the description of lackluster and disappointing. Why? Well, because typically, the anomalous modifications the genie makes are highly detrimental to the subject in question. You see, SCP-4035-1 has a habit of taking things extremely literally, almost to a pedantic extent, intentionally misinterpreting and leaving any who accidentally make a wish with it harmful changes to their minds and bodies. And like most genies from mythology, this one doesn't undo the wishes that it grants. After bestowing someone with abilities that usually leave them in agony or distress, the genie disappears back into SCP-4035, causing the light bulb inside to violently explode. Should someone attempt to replace it and get the genie to reverse whatever horrific change it has made, its voice will emanate from the lamp and yell, Sorry kid, no refunds. But how bad could these abilities possibly be? Well, to find out the answer, you only have to take a look at a select few of the numerous tests the SCP Foundation has done involving SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock, at one point in time, is assigned to be the head researcher in charge of conducting experiments on SCP-4035. The approach he takes is sending members of disposable D-Class personnel to interact with the lamp and genie, then record the results. The first test unfolds as follows. The subject, a D-Class with the designation number D-4088, is sent into the containment chamber that houses SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock instructs him to place a light bulb in the socket and request telepathic abilities from SCP-4035-1. However, as the genie emerges, its sudden presence startles the D-Class, and he makes an expletive exclamation that we won't repeat. It was words to the effect of, What the heck is this? As a result, the genie grants D-4088 an ability that relates to the sentence he said. And to call it particularly unpleasant might be something of an understatement. You see, because of a certain word the D-Class had used, the genie gives him the ability to identify the chemical composition of what we'll refer to as waste. The fact that he can even identify what kind of creature said waste comes from does little to make D-4088 happy with his newfound power. Dr. Bannock is forced to refine his experimentation strategy following this bungled first attempt. In the lead-up to the second test, he informs the next D-Class candidate of what exactly they will be facing when they enter the chamber, so as not to be caught by surprise at the sight of the genie. As a result, the second D-Class subject repeats the process of activating SCP-4035 and calmly repeats the request for telepathic abilities that he's been told to ask for. I'd like to be able to read minds. Unfortunately, his wording means things haven't exactly gone according to plan. Testing with this subject reveals he hasn't developed any telepathic abilities. Disappointed, Dr. Bannock has the subject released back into Foundation incarceration alongside his fellow D-Class prisoners. However, several weeks pass, and it soon becomes apparent what ability this inmate has been granted. He encounters another D-Class, one of many pulled from maximum security prisons around the globe, this particular inmate has a tattoo on his forehead of a few words in Chinese. However, to the former test subject, these phrases appear to have been translated to English and read, Cuban butter mustache. When he reveals the mistake made by his fellow inmate's tattoo artist, the subject is attacked and beaten up. He had, however, gained the ability to read minds. He can understand any form of writing on the forehead of a living being. A little time passes, and Dr. Bannock finds himself still struggling to get SCP-4035-1 to bestow any worthwhile abilities to test subjects. The genie just seems to take everything far too literally, interpreting every wish with no regard for normal speech and colloquialisms, even disregarding the safety of the person making the wish. Dr. Bannock conducts yet another test, sending a member of D-Class to speak with the genie and telling him to wish for muscle regeneration. The D-Class places the request with SCP-4035-1 seemingly without issue. However, then comes the next part, testing whether this new anomalous ability actually works the way Dr. Bannock intends. The subject of this latest experiment is intentionally injured, 
As this happens, his body appears to rapidly change. His muscular system swells up and multiplies, increasing from its original size. A successful test, right? Well, it would be, if the rapid muscle regeneration actually stopped. Before long, the D-Class test subject's muscle tissue is almost 250% bigger than its original size, making it much bigger than the rest of his body too. The subject is clearly highly distressed, although fortunately, this doesn't continue for long. Unfortunately, that's because his body can't function normally with this new rapid change, and as a result, the D-Class subject's vital signs stop after three short seconds. Getting more and more frustrated with the disastrous outcomes, Dr. Bannock makes the decision to simplify the requests made to the genie. Surely it can't misinterpret one word, can it? The next test that Bannock conducts sees yet another unwitting member of D-Class, D-1899, entering the containment chamber and placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, just like her predecessors have done. She follows her instructions, and as the genie appears, she asks for one thing. Flight. A short while later, the genie once again vanishes and leaves D-1899 with her wish. She has instantly become unaffected by the Earth's gravitational pull like normal. Within seconds, she is floating above the ground, as if experiencing the zero gravity of traveling in outer space. That certainly sounds idyllic, doesn't it? After all, who doesn't wish they could fly? To be granted the unique opportunity to view the majesty of the world from high above. Just one problem, though. Getting back down. D-1899 quickly realizes, as does an agitated Dr. Bannock, that she isn't in control of her newfound flying abilities. She can't alter her direction or return back down to ground level at will. She's stuck, floating in the air, only able to affect her trajectory by propelling herself off of solid structures. The results of SCP-4035 tests continue to be somewhat undesirable to say the least. An interaction with the genie that begins with the phrase, uh, hey man, causes the D-Class who spoke to be suddenly replaced with a crude scarecrow. When another subject makes a wish for a new life, they die almost instantly. Only four moments later, one of the Foundation's researchers to suddenly give birth to a baby with identical genetic makeup to the now deceased D-Class. Another test sees a member of D-Class personnel enter the containment chamber with the instruction to wish for whatever they can think of. Put on the spot, they're unsure what to request when the genie appears, and instead, they only offer up the response, I don't know. Moments later, this subject falls into a catatonic state and eventually passes away. An autopsy of the subject's body reveals that their hippocampus has been removed. Thanks to the genie, they literally didn't know anything. Further testing with SCP-4035 is later carried out, however, it should be noted that the next instance of a recorded experiment with a genie isn't one that was authorized by the SCP Foundation. Rather, hearing that there was a genie being tested, junior researcher Jacobson decides to try and make his ultimate wish come true. He's never been all that lucky in love and it's left the young Foundation researcher with a little insecurity. Nothing that a visit to SCP-4035-1 can't fix, surely. Despite not being authorized to use SCP-4035, junior researcher Jacobson approaches the lamp within its containment chamber. He then repeats the process to make SCP-4035-1 appear, and then requests that the genie grant his wish. Make me more attractive? In an ideal world, this scenario wraps up with junior researcher Jacobson becoming more handsome by conventional standards, perhaps even improving his sense of insecurity as a result. But by now, you can probably guess, that isn't what happens at all. Instead, being as literal as ever, the genie grants the young researcher's wish and makes him more attractive. Seconds later, as soon as the genie has demanifested, Jacobson is suddenly flung across the containment chamber and smacked sharply against the solid wall. The sheer force of the impact gives the junior researcher a severe spinal fracture. Of course, this catches the attention of Foundation security, who bring junior researcher Jacobson to the on-site medical center. There he is given a full analysis, and this reveals the extent of just how attractive the genie has made him. Junior researcher Jacobson's epidermis, his outer layer of skin, has been given properties similar to that of a high-powered magnet. He has been magnetically attracted to the metallic walls of the containment chamber, resulting in a spinal injury that would claim his life only two hours later. The extensive testing with SCP-4035 is still ongoing, and as a result, the Foundation sees it fit to keep a large supply of light bulbs near the lamp's containment chamber. 
Dr. Bannock's research seems to indicate that while a person is in close proximity with SCP-4035, they are more likely to suffer a sudden and inexplicable speech problem. For example, the most common of these are parapraxis, commonly known as a Freudian slip, or ankyloglossia, which is a condition wherein the skin joining a person's tongue to the bottom of their mouth is shorter than usual. And this affects normal tongue movement, sometimes being called a tongue tie. Being closer to SCP-4035-1 increases the chances of suffering some form of unintended speech mistake by 68% when talking to the genie. To cut a long story short, the genie doesn't just intentionally and obtusely interpret everything literally, but also directly affects how clear a person will be while making their wish. As for exactly where SCP-4035 comes from, there's little information available. Some theories suggest it might well be an actual mythological genie who is just tired of spending so many centuries in the business of granting wishes for mortals. After all, imagine you get trapped in a desk lamp for all eternity and have to magically fulfill the requests of anyone that comes across you. Living through that for so long is liable to make a genie bitter and petty. Then again, perhaps the genie isn't even really a genuine genie. It doesn't inhabit an oil lamp, but instead a broken table lamp. And instead of granting wishes in the way they're intended, it misinterprets and takes things too literally, leaving the poor fools who thought they'd be blessed with supernatural powers to deal with the consequences. But perhaps that's the point. If nothing else, the genie residing in SCP-4035 serves as a reminder of that important lesson, to be careful what you wish for. In any case, if we were going looking for a genie, we'd take the friendly Robin Williams type over this pedantic jerk any day. It's Saturday night, and a teenaged boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall, with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little… off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone but they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's them, a pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them, they look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as My Face That I May Be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point, but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. 
What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below them all, deep underground, something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site-81715, an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81715. These instances are considered hostile, and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed and what exactly the pit is are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715-A instances exist down in the pit. With the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces, SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. The Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter, and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B, who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715-B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher Doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. 
All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B, and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715, the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. Do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715-B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit, and what will they do should they ever get out? Investigations are ongoing. A young man tosses and turns in bed. He adjusts his pillow and tries sleeping on his back, his side, his stomach, but nothing works. He rolls over to check the time, 3 a.m. This is the third night in a row he hasn't been able to fall asleep. He feels tired, he wants to sleep, but every time he closes his eyes and sleep starts to creep in, something happens, and suddenly he's wide awake again. It's as if someone keeps flipping a switch in his brain to awake, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's affecting everything in his life. He can't concentrate in class, his work performance goes down the drain, even his hobbies become completely unenjoyable. All he wants to do is sleep. His friends and family can tell something is wrong. It's as if he has become a different person, and they urge him to go see a doctor. But the doctors tell him there's nothing they can do for him. He's perfectly healthy otherwise. He should try some natural remedies like valerian root and get more exercise. He has no idea how many days he's been awake now. Four? Five? Maybe more? At this point, the lack of sleep isn't even the worst part. It's the hallucinations. Sometimes they're just a shadow dancing outside of his vision, but others are incredibly vivid, feeling more real than his now dreary life does. He had to stop going to work and class entirely since he can't concentrate for more than a couple of seconds at a time. His friends don't want anything to do with him, and who can blame them? He has uncontrollable mood swings and lashes out for no reason. He's tried every sleep remedy there is. He took the doctor's advice and exercised as hard as he ever has. But with never being able to sleep, he has no energy left. He's becoming a living zombie. He gets up out of bed but loses his balance and collapses to the floor. He tries to get up, but he can't. He'll just lie there for a while. He starts to drift away, and he readies himself for the jolt that always wakes him back up. But this time, it doesn't come. The wave of sleep that starts to wash over him feels different this time, though. It's heavier, 
more peaceful, and more permanent. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-966, also known as Sleep Killer. SCP-966 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to a creature that belongs to a group of anomalous predatory beasts, standing 1.4 to 1.6 meters tall and weighing roughly 30 kilograms. These hairless humanoids have an elongated face, a mouth full of pointed needle-like teeth, and each of their hands has five razor-sharp claws that can be up to 20 centimeters in length. Though unlike humans and apes, they are digitigrade, meaning that they walk using only their toes. But you won't be able to see the horrible visage of SCP-966 under normal circumstances, as they are only visible under very specific lighting conditions. They can only be viewed under light that has a wavelength between roughly 700 and 900 nanometers, which is just at the edge of the light spectrum that's visible to humans stretching into what's known as infrared light. The only exception to this is if their skin, muscles, or organs have suffered from second or third degree burns, in which case, the affected areas of their body will show up under a greater spectrum of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. Though frightening to look at, SCP-966 are actually quite weak physically, with very low muscular density. Their bones are hollow, similar to birds, and while their claws may be incredibly sharp, they are also easily broken, making them unsuited for use in combat. Additionally, they do not rest through sleep, but will, at seemingly random times, stop all movement and fall into a rest period that lasts roughly three to five minutes, after which they are able to resume their normal behavior. With all of these physical shortcomings, how did SCP-966 gain a reputation as such a fearsome hunter? The secret lies in their ability to emit bursts of a previously unknown type of wave. Hunting either alone or in pairs, SCP-966 uses this wave to inhibit its prey's ability to enter any of the restful sleep stages and also stops the ability to micro-sleep. These waves have been observed to be effective at up to 20 meters, though tests have shown that they can be blocked by post-transition metals, of which lead appears to be especially effective. SCP-966 hunts and feeds on medium to large-sized animals, which includes humans, and once their quarry has been targeted by the sleep-inhibiting waves, the effect is permanent with no method having yet been discovered that will allow them to regain the ability to sleep. Experiments have shown that unconsciousness can be induced in other ways, such as with the use of general anesthesia, though these methods have ultimately proven to be ineffective, since although the victim is unconscious, they are still not receiving any of the restful benefits of sleep while in that state. The effects of sleep deprivation on humans, both mentally and physically, are devastating. Symptoms can begin setting in after just 24 hours that can include mood swings, memory issues, and sensory impairment. After two to three days, the body's hormones become deregulated, and bodily functions like hunger, thirst, and temperature fluctuate wildly as cognitive abilities start to dramatically decline. Hallucinations, paranoia, and fits of rage are common, and the risk of death from sleep deprivation increases with each day that passes without sleep. And this is exactly what SCP-966 wants. After surreptitiously sending a burst of sleep deprivation waves at their victim, they will then stalk their prey until lack of sleep finally leads to total incapacitation, at which point SCP-966 consumes them. SCP-966 have proven to be both extremely quiet and agile when hunting. However, they have actually been observed intentionally making threatening noises around their prey presumably to further increase their already elevated stress levels, and potentially hastening their mental degradation. On rare occasions, they will even physically assault their victim to further degenerate their mental and physical health. Some of SCP-966's prey will experience especially intense hallucinations and bouts of rage, which is theorized to be caused by prolonged exposure to multiple instances of their sleep-stopping waves. Why some victims are exposed to multiple waves when a single instance has been shown to be 100% effective is unknown, and it's hypothesized that they may only engage in this behavior when especially hungry to try and speed up the process. Though others have put forth the theory that SCP-966 may take some perverse form of joy in seeing its victims suffer prior to expiring. Wild instances of SCP-966 have been found across the globe, 
And while the SCP Foundation has been successful in thinning their numbers, they still exist in high enough numbers to pose a serious threat to humanity. For these reasons, they have been assigned the classification Euclid. Mobile Task Forces IOTA-1 and IOTA-2, codenamed the Dream Hunters and Air Chasers respectively, are continually monitoring for any reports of sudden or violent deaths related to sleep deprivation in order to identify and neutralize the remaining instances of wild SCP-966. Four SCP-966 specimens, three males and one female, have been acquired by the Foundation, and they are currently contained in a 10 by 10 meter room that is lined with lead and equipped with infrared security cameras. Each specimen is fed 20 kilograms of meat each month, and in the event that the female specimen gives birth, the new specimen is to be taken for observation and study before being disposed of prior to reaching maturity. A doctor frantically writes in his journal, It's almost impossible to believe everything that's transpired has taken place in such a short amount of time. It all began three days ago. It was just another day down in the mines. A worker was drilling into a seam of coal when suddenly there was an issue with the rig. From what I've gathered, it sounds like the drill bit exploded due to some kind of mechanical defect, sending shards of metal flying throughout the tunnel. The worker was lucky that none of the large pieces struck him, as they surely would have been fatal. He had, though, still been grazed by a piece of shrapnel from the ruined drill bit, and it had left a deep cut across his upper arm. Other miners who were working nearby heard the commotion and quickly came to his aid. They applied a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood and helped him to the mineshaft elevator for the long ride to the surface. Once they reached the safety of daylight, they brought the injured man to the on-site medical clinic where I was on duty at the time. I cleaned the wound since there was a substantial amount of coal dust that had gotten inside before suturing and bandaging it. The miner was sent to his bunkhouse to recover, and I thought that would be the end of it. Of course, it was only the beginning. Roughly 24 hours later, the same miner presented himself to me once again. I asked about his injury and he explained that while his arm was fine, he now felt like he might be coming down with an illness. His symptoms included a runny nose, a cough, and body aches, so my assumption was that he'd simply had some bad luck and caught a cold that just so happened to coincide with being injured on the job. I sent him to his bunk once again, telling him that he wouldn't be able to work and should instead use the day to rest and recover. The next day I was once again in the clinic when my phone rang. It wasn't the sick miner, but instead his supervisor. The miner hadn't shown up for his shift that morning and he asked for me to go check on him since he knew he hadn't been feeling well. I agreed that it was strange that neither of us had heard anything else from the miner and went to see him straight away. I entered the bunkhouse where many of the workers stay while on site at this remote mine. It was empty, except for the injured miner who was still in his bed. As I approached, I could immediately tell something was very wrong. The man was curled up in the fetal position, and was sweating profusely while also shivering. A quick touch of his forehead revealed that the man had a high fever, too. He was practically incoherent, seemingly delirious from his high temperature. The miner was moved to the empty bed inside the clinic so I could better observe and tend to him, but very carefully since I assumed now that he was actually suffering from influenza and didn't want to risk an outbreak at the mine. I was getting ready to administer fluids to the miner, who was still mumbling incomprehensibly, when I noticed something on his face. It appeared that he was crying, but the tears that ran down his cheeks weren't made of water. They were blood. I hadn't seen anything like it before. There was no reason why influenza should be causing this man to cry tears of blood. I could see the veins in his forehead starting to pulse, as if his blood pressure had suddenly skyrocketed. And just as I was leaning in to get a closer look, something horrible happened. The miner suddenly opened his mouth and expelled an enormous stream of blood. The blast of blood struck me in the face and knocked me backwards in fright as the man continued expelling more and more blood from his mouth, which soon covered the walls of the clinic. With seemingly all the blood having been discharged from his body, the man then went limp. I attempted to resuscitate him, but strangely, there was no need. The man was comatose, but he was alive. There I was, standing in the middle of the clinic over the man, both he, myself, as well as the room completely covered in blood. It was one of the worst things I'd ever experienced as a doctor, and yet somehow, it was about to get even worse. I was still in shock from what had just happened when I heard the door to the clinic open behind me. 
I turned around to see a group of half a dozen more miners from the site, each one coughing, sweating, and shivering. One held a cloth to his ear that was stained red, while another attempted to stop his nose from bleeding. Whatever had infected the first patient wasn't a one-off medical event. This had the makings of an epidemic. I knew that I was in way over my head. I was just a general practitioner, not an infectious disease specialist, and I called the Center for Disease Control to get their guidance. I was told to quarantine the sick men as best I could, and that a rapid response team would be sent who were better equipped to deal with potential outbreaks. While I waited for the CDC to arrive, I began moving the afflicted men to a bunkhouse that had been designated for quarantining. Several more also began expelling huge amounts of blood, though unlike the first patient, none of the others survived the traumatic event. As I was putting the final infected man into a bed, I noticed something, though. There was a huge amount of heat radiating off of his lower body, and when I pulled down the blankets, I discovered something that even with all of the strange happenings, I still couldn't believe. There were huge lumps growing on his legs, each of which looked to be filled with some kind of fluid or gas, and they were extremely hot to the touch, as if the chemicals inside the lumps were creating a source of heat. As I was investigating the bizarre growths, I suddenly looked up to see that the man was no longer in a state of delirium. Instead, a crazed look had come over his eyes, and he suddenly leapt out of bed, flailing and clawing at me as if he wanted to kill me. I don't know how, but I was able to fight off the man and run out of the bunkhouse. He gave chase, though, and with no other option, I ran into a nearby storage shed. The man was beating and scratching at the door, but I was able to barricade it by dragging a heavy shelf in front of it. After several minutes of trying to break inside, he finally gave up and left. And here I remain. I'm too afraid to go back out. It seems that if the disease won't kill me, then whatever it is turning people into will. All I can do is wait for the CDC team to get here and hopefully know how to deal with whatever the situation has become. The doctor closes his small notebook and notices a drop of something fall onto the cover. He reaches up and wipes his hand across his mouth. It comes back, covered in blood. The doctor didn't know what the disease was that had so rapidly spread through the workers at the mine, nor did the CDC response team when they arrived. No, it wasn't until the SCP Foundation caught word of the mysterious outbreak that someone would finally determine what was happening with what would soon be called SCP-016, which is also known as the Sentient Microorganism. SCP-016 is a blood-borne pathogen that was first discovered after a worker at a remote mine was injured while drilling into a coal seam deep beneath the earth. It is theorized that coal dust entered the wound, dust which perhaps carried dormant spores of what would become SCP-016. Over the next several days, all of the remaining employees at the mine were infected, as was the CDC crisis team that was sent to the mine to investigate the outbreak of what was potentially an undiscovered pathogen. Following the CDC's inability to deal with the disease, the SCP Foundation took over the site and quickly terminated all affected personnel in order to prevent further spread. The first infected person, Patient Zero, was taken into Foundation custody for further investigation, and the mine shaft itself was collapsed by an explosive device in order to seal it off. After studying Patient Zero, the Foundation learned a great deal about just what they were dealing with. What they found was that SCP-016 has an incubation period that can vary wildly from just 24 hours to as long as two years, with the length appearing to be dependent on the number of other potential human hosts in the immediate area. Once symptoms begin to present in an individual, they will at first look to be quite similar to the common cold. They can include coughing, a runny nose, itchy eyes, and body aches. Roughly 48 hours after the first symptoms, the infected person will experience a form of hemorrhagic fever, similar to the Ebola virus, which causes a small amount of bleeding in the lungs. This leads to the infected blood becoming aspirated, most likely in order to better spread through the air. The third stage of the disease leads to the host crashing and bleeding out, as they start to bleed profusely from multiple body orifices, including the nose, tear ducts, mouth, and even through the pores of their skin. Their blood pressure will also skyrocket during this final stage, and in some cases, have vomited blood as far as 5 meters. Oddly enough, although most die from the traumatic event, this almost complete exsanguination will not always result in death. Sometimes, following the removal of almost all blood from the body, the patient will somehow survive, and the pathogen inside their body will return to its dormant phase once again, before eventually repeating the process. 
But SCP-016 is more than just a rapid and often deadly bloodborne disease, as you will soon see. As SCP researchers studied the disease, what they discovered was that it had a very strange property that sets it apart from other hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and the Marburg virus. What they found was that when someone infected with SCP-016 is placed into a high-stress situation, such as one where their life is being threatened, SCP-016 will transition from rapidly reproducing inside of its host's body to instead begin rewriting their host's actual DNA. This genetic manipulation, combined with the stimulation of rapid cell division, leads to the host undergoing major physiological changes and in extremely small amounts of time. In just 24 hours, the host can begin showing physical changes to their body and a complete bodily reconstruction can occur in less than two weeks. Most of the hosts who begin to undergo physical changes will not survive the process, due to how heavily the transformation stresses the body, but those that do will be changed in more than just physical ways. They'll exhibit hyper-aggressive behaviors not dissimilar to those infected by rabies. And it's theorized that the pathogen may cause this behavior in order to better spread the virus. When the Foundation realized that SCP-016 was capable of these transformative effects, they immediately undertook a number of experiments on D-Class personnel in order to better understand their full extent. In the first test, a D-Class was infected with SCP-016, and as soon as they began showing symptoms, their cell was slowly flooded with water in order to stimulate the life-threatening situation needed to trigger the transformation process. Over the next 24 hours, researchers watched as the subject appeared to develop gills which would allow it to survive in the now water-filled cell. The transformations didn't stop there though, and over the next two weeks, the subject also had their limbs change into fins, their eyesight deteriorated, and their sense of hearing increased as they developed an echolocation ability very similar to the one employed by whales and dolphins. The experiment was concluded by removing all of the water from the cell leading to the death of the subject from asphyxiation as they could no longer breathe in the open air. A similar experiment was performed on another D-Class, but this time, instead of taking on aquatic animal properties, the D-Class experienced rapid muscle growth and their knuckles grew bone-like protrusions. It attempted to use both of these to break through the door of their flooding cell, but they were unable to breach the reinforced steel and soon died from drowning. The Foundation now knew that the virus could react in different ways to the same situation. The same experiment was run a third time, but in this instance, the infected D-Class exhibited an entirely different means of trying to escape. The subject had a massive growth appear on its chest, which seemed to be fed from two different tubes of flesh, also emanating from the subject's body. Fearing what it planned to do, the Foundation ended the experiment early and terminated the subject. An autopsy revealed that the growth was actually a hollow chamber that was being fed by the tubes with oxygen and acetylene gas, which when combined in sufficient amounts would cause a massive combustion event. In other words, SCP-016 was turning the subject into a living bomb. Moving on from flooded cell tests, the researchers next left the D-Class inside of a room with no stressing elements and instead told them to focus on growing a pair of wings. Without any reason to begin the transformation process, SCP-016 went through its normal stages and the subject died from blood loss without any other changes occurring. In the final test, a D-Class was placed inside of an acrylic box that was suspended over a mine shaft, with a timer attached indicating the time when the bottom of the box would open and drop the D-Class into the thousand-foot deep shaft. This D-Class was also told to focus on growing wings that would allow them to survive the plunge. The subject began to transform over the next 24 hours, but rather than grow wings, they instead developed a tentacle-like appendage on their arm that was capable of producing silk similar to a spider's spinneret. They used the silk-producing organ to secure themselves to the box, showing that subjects did not appear to be able to control the way in which SCP-016 would alter their bodies. This experiment concluded when the timer reached zero and the bomb attached to it detonated, as had been the plan all along. Following this last test, SCP-016 samples were placed into containment, and access to the sample for experimental purposes is only allowed with prior authorization from Level 4 or O5 personnel, with full documentation of the proposed experiment required beforehand. Failure to follow any of these procedures will lead to the offending personnel being reassigned to D-Class duty or terminated. SCP-016 has been classified as Keter and the only existing sample is kept in a petri dish which is under extreme lockdown inside of a 5x5x5 meter room. 
where the temperature is kept below zero degrees Celsius at all times. Should an outbreak of SCP-016 occur, all infected personnel are to be immediately terminated on site, and if the infection cannot be contained within 48 hours, then the on-site nuclear device is to be detonated prior to any additional personnel being evacuated. While the containment procedures may sound callous, unfortunately when it comes to anomalous pathogens as dangerous as SCP-016, no chances can be taken. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybelle is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Marybelle keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Marybelle shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe, and in this weather she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains, she'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's… No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale, deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um, we have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only the sound of his breath is joined by another 
a tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. 
The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Marybelle was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a… oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It… but it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma's stopped moaning. 
The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Mary Bell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Maribel whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Maribel down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe. Mary Bell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. There's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong, too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. 
Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms – lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a ten-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a nine-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr. The room is cold from the wind, but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, 
and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go. Good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it, and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does, though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go. No blankets, just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. She picks it up and examines the cute animal print, remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch, or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend, though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time, and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. 
Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter-feeding state, though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. It's a quiet day in a small American town. It's warm, with a slight breeze. A calm, simple Sunday, just like so many others. Very few people set their alarms, and most are still asleep at 8 a.m. It's the kind of town where everyone knows and trusts everyone else. After all, what are good neighbors for? While his wife still sleeps back in their modest home, a retired man in his mid-sixties decides to start the day off right. With a rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other, he makes his way down the side of a grassy embankment towards his favorite fishing spot along the local river. 
He's even got a pair of neatly cut sandwiches in an old-fashioned metal lunch pail, the picture of small-town bliss. But something he sees stops him in his tracks, something large floating in the water. He freezes. He wants to write it off as driftwood or some trash that someone has thrown into the river, but in his heart of hearts, he knows better than that. What's floating in the water is a human corpse. Not long after, the local sheriff's department is on the scene, dredging the body out of the water. It's about as small and underfunded as you can expect for a group of police officers from a place where nothing ever seems to happen. There hadn't been a murder in this quaint little burg in years. When they turn over the body, it isn't hard to make a positive ID. The pallid, water-bloated face of a well-known local man stares up at them with blank, dead eyes. Some in attendance gasp at the sight of it. It had been years since the last murder in town. But when that last murder had occurred, the prime suspect had been this very same man. Ten years prior, he had been a successful local mechanic, but that all changed when his wife turned up dead in a field, her face caved in by some kind of heavy bludgeoning instrument. It was a brutal crime, the most horrific the town had ever seen. Reporters traveled in from all over the state to cover it, and that's when the web of secrets tied around this one tragic incident began to truly unravel. It was an open secret in town that the man and his wife weren't exactly on the fondest of terms. He was known for having affairs with women half his age. Rumor had it that his wife was tired of being betrayed and humiliated by her good-for-nothing philandering husband and was finally going to break it off. With the knowledge of his infidelity being so public, she'd take him for all he was worth in divorce court. And it wasn't long after these rumors began that she turned up dead. Soon, fingers were pointed. Most of them, naturally, in the man's direction. He lawyered up and denied every charge, but in the court of public opinion, he'd already been convicted. That, however, was the only court he'd ever be convicted in. Despite the wealth of circumstantial evidence, there wasn't enough to convict him of his wife's killing. He was acquitted of all charges and went free, despite his reputation in town taking a severe dive. In the next few years, he'd marry one of his very young mistresses, and the news story would fade away back into the darkness of small-town rumors and hearsay. The murder of his wife would remain forever unsolved. With all the context in mind, the fishermen, a few locals, and the handful of police officers stare down at the dead face of the man, his soaked body sprawled out on the riverbank. A police deputy uses a gloved hand to tilt his head upward slightly, revealing the long, deep wound in his throat carved so deep it cuts to bone. His throat had been slashed, and whoever had done it had been extremely thorough. The identity of the victim had been confirmed, as had the method of murder. Only one question remained. Who murdered him? Hours later, across town, a man wakes up alone in bed after a long, refreshing sleep. His young wife of five years went downstairs a few hours before to do some chores and cook breakfast, leaving him to his rest. He rubs the sleep from his eyes and yawns. It's a sunny day outside. How wonderful. And he can smell breakfast cooking downstairs. He smiles, gets up, dresses, and makes his way down the stairs at a leisurely pace. He can hear his wife humming in the kitchen. As he passes the threshold, he calls her name, and she freezes up. Her body shakes slightly. Is that fear? He doesn't understand. He steps closer. Suddenly, she turns and screams at him, like he's an intruder wearing a ski mask and holding out a knife. He tells her that it's just him, that everything is fine. He begs her to explain what's going on. Instead, she asks what he's doing in her house and threatens to call the police. He has no idea what's going on. He takes another step forward, and she reacts severely. His young wife grabs the handle of her frying pan and swings it, hitting him as sausages and hot oil fly through the air. He shrieks in a mix of pain, shock, and pure terror before running out of the room. What is happening? Has his wife lost her mind? He needs to get help immediately. He rushes out of his house, but when he reaches the street outside, he finds no safety or comfort, only confused, judgmental stares from his supposed neighbors. They all turn to look at him with the exact same expression as his wife, a look that says, who are you? As he continues to run, calling for help and fighting back the pain of his oil-scalded skin, he just gets more of those same stares from everyone he encounters. They look at him like he's some kind of raving madman, not someone who'd just been the victim of a random and brutal domestic assault. And yet, back at his home, his wife is already calling the local police to tell them about the stranger who'd just broken into her house and tried to attack her. The sheriff's department deputy on the other end of the line can't believe what he's hearing. A man turns up dead in the local river, and the 
before they can even give his wife the news, she's calling to report that a stranger had tried to attack her in her own home. Could it be any more obvious that this stranger was the one behind her husband's murder? Given that everyone knows everyone in a town like this, it stands to reason that her husband's killer and his wife's home invader must have come from out of town, perhaps a drifter or someone her husband had owed money to. Given the kind of person he was, it was no surprise that he'd burned some kind of bridge badly enough that someone out there would want him dead and act on that desire. Case closed. All that was left to do now was catch this violent madman and bring him to justice before he could hurt anyone else. What kind of justice would they give him exactly? Well, they could decide on the particulars later. As the man continues his frantic run across town, searching in vain for somebody, anybody to come to his aid, rumors begin to spread through town. After all, in a place where everyone knows everyone, people have a tendency to talk. It doesn't take long for half of the town to hear about the local man who'd been found dead in the river with his throat slashed open, that the same maniac that killed him had made an attempt on his young wife's life and she just barely managed to fight him off, that the murderer had come in from out of town and that now he was running through the streets, babbling like a psychopath. It doesn't take long for a consensus to form. It's clear that, if left to his own devices, this outsider will only hurt more people. Who will it be next? It could be any of them. The townsfolk feel afraid, upset, unsafe, but most of all, they feel paranoid. The shadow of the maniac seems to be lurking around every corner. If they want to keep themselves safe and avenge the death of the poor man in the river, they'll need to take justice into their own hands, or this intruder could completely upend their town's quiet life. It's the only way. They unlock their gun safes and arm themselves with shotguns, handguns, and rifles. Those without guns grab bats, hammers, and knives. Some grab shovels and pitchforks from their tool sheds. This loose maniac may be dangerous, but they have numbers on their side. Together, they'll find him and give him what he deserves. The man is still running through the streets, in pain, wondering where everyone has gone. His life is falling apart around him, and he doesn't even know why. Is this all a nightmare? Is he going insane? Before long, he can hear footsteps. People are approaching in groups, yelling, chanting. He sees a crowd turn a nearby corner and stare. Guns, knives, literal pitchforks and torches. Wide, bulging eyes and boring teeth. Someone points at him and barks, There he is! Get him! That's when he realizes that, for some reason, these maniacs have it in for him too. He turns tail and begins to run. He hasn't gone insane. Everyone else has. He can hear the thundering of their many footsteps chasing him. He ducks and screams as gunshots ring out, whizzing past him. Some even throw rocks. All these people. This isn't fear, this is pure, undiluted rage. They want to kill him in the street in broad daylight. He hears some of them screaming, Murderer! Murderer! We'll get you! In his terrified mind, he wonders, Is this what this is all about? His first wife? He'd been acquitted, it was so many years ago. Why would they all turn on him? Why now? It's... Relief swells and washes over him when he sees a police cruiser making its way towards him from the other end of the street. They'd save him from these bloodthirsty maniacs. The car comes to a stop, and a pair of familiar police officers step out. They seem oddly calm given the situation. The man approaches, trying to plead with him through a throat racked by pain, exhaustion, and terror. The mob is hot on his heels now. He needs help. He desperately needs help. But as he tries to form the words, he gets a hard lesson in the fact that these police officers are the wrong people to come to for that. The one closest to him slides the baton out of his belt and strikes the man across the face. His face feels a sudden explosion of pain as his cheekbone shatters. Before he can even register what's going on, the other officer strikes the back of his leg with his baton, and he crumbles to the ground. The two of them begin beating him relentlessly while he begs for mercy through broken teeth and it's not long until the rest of the mob catches up and surrounds him. With a final strike to the face, everything goes black. When he opens his eyes, it's nighttime, and he can feel something constricting his wrists and neck. Heavy ropes cut into his skin. His hands are bound, and there's a noose around his neck, the other end tied to a branch of a tree above him. His feet teeter precariously on a stool below. The rope has no slack. He's surrounded by the townspeople, all armed and staring hatefully at him. The only light comes from their burning torches. The sheriff stands at the front of the crowd, his weeping wife standing next to him. With a stony face, he dictates that, for the crime of murder, he has been found guilty and is sentenced to hang by the neck until he is dead. His eyes widen one last time in pure panic as the sheriff holds up a photo of the dead man pulled from the river. What? No, there must be some kind of terrible mistake. 
I didn't kill that man. I am that man. I am. I swear. Please. But before he can even form the words, his own wife steps forward and kicks out the stool from under his feet. While this story of fear, paranoia, mob mentality, and unspeakable violence may seem as sadly natural and human as breathing air, the spark that ignited this tinderbox was decidedly inhuman. This is SCP-3852, also known as Small Town Justice. First, meet SCP-3852-1. No matter what your gut feeling may be, I assure you that you do not recognize him. He's an unidentified male corpse, and also an intrinsic factor in the SCP-3852 phenomenon. There are many SCP-3852-1 instances, and all of them are physically and biologically identical. And if ever you encounter one of them, unless the SCP Foundation can intervene in time, something terrible will happen. To put it simply, one of these unidentified corpses will manifest within the bounds of a small town or village typical with a population of over 2,000 people on the East Coast or in the Midwest of the United States. Upon someone seeing the SCP-3852-1 corpse, the SCP-3852 phenomenon will begin. Despite having no internal or external injuries in an objective sense, the victims of its anomalous effects will believe that it is a person from their town who has been recently murdered, despite the fact that this victim is very much alive in town. While initially it was believed that the selection of the victim, dubbed SCP-3852-2, was entirely random, as more and more SCP-3852 incidents popped up since the first was recorded in 1978, a pattern began to emerge. It was discovered that the victims were all people who were believed to have committed some serious or repeated crimes in the past, but who were acquitted or otherwise cleared of charges. But when the phenomenon begins, a frightening switch occurs. While the body will take on the identity of the victim for a number of the township citizens, the actual victim will become a depersonalized stranger, an outsider, someone to be looked upon with active suspicion that soon grows into paranoia and, eventually, uncontrollable rage and bloodlust. But the fury of the mob being directed at one person is one thing, a town being dragged into what seems like an outright civil war is quite another. The mob will arm themselves and go on the hunt for the accused. During the process, if anyone in town attempts to stop them, such as when individuals try to stand up on behalf of the accused encouraging the mob to exercise caution and approach the situation rationally, as happens in many SCP-3852 events, they too will become perceived differently. It is estimated that between 11 and 27% of the affected community will not be swayed to join the vigilante group, and when they refute the accusations, they will be accused of trying to impede the course of justice. When the violence eventually breaks out though, as it always does, they will not be spared. When the victim that started it all is finally found, they will be violently executed, at which point the townsfolk will all begin behaving normally and life will resume once more as if nothing ever happened. In the aftermath, People will give inconsistent accounts of what occurred, but none will experience any long-term traumatic effects from taking part in or witnessing the violence. Since the phenomenon was first noted back in 1978, the SCP Foundation has recorded 16 different SCP-3852 incidents, some of which have been appended to the official files for expository purposes. One such event, labeled EV-3852-07F3T, is the very first that the Foundation encountered. During this 3852 event, which occurred in a small town in Indiana, 368 people were brought under the thrall of the anomaly's effects when the SCP-3852-1 body was encountered in the town square just after sunrise and was identified as belonging to a 28-year-old local unemployed man named Glenn. It didn't take long for the citizens to turn on the still-living Glenn, causing the poor young man to try and flee from the hundreds of people baying for his blood. He was eventually overtaken by the townsfolk while trying to cross a river and escape from the town. He was pulled from the river and beaten viciously. He was then dragged back into the town square and hanged for his perceived crime of murdering himself. The SCP Foundation managed to recover the anomalous SCP-3852-1 corpse before questioning the remaining townsfolk and administering amnestics. An even worse event occurred 18 years later in Ohio, recorded as EV-3852-15C1K. This time, 572 people were affected by SCP-3852 when the body of a controversial local man named Hector was discovered in a nearby schoolyard. Hector was a former factory worker until he was involved in a drunk driving incident that resulted in another driver dying and left Hector paralyzed from the waist down. When the body was found, 
suspicion of course immediately fell upon the real Hector for the crime. When roughly 23% of the community objected to these accusations, they also became targets of the violent mob intent on taking Hector's life out of their twisted sense of justice. When later interviewing one of the mob's ringleaders, a 52-year-old named Matthew Escott, the Foundation discovered that neither him nor any of the other mob members noticed the strange coincidence that Hector's killer was also a paraplegic man of about the same size and build as Hector. As predicted, nobody involved seemed to carry any guilt or even full awareness of what they'd carried out in pursuit of justice. Hector and those who were attempting to defend him were chased into an abandoned barn on the edge of town for a final standoff. The mob dragged out Hector and his defenders and brutally murdered them all. MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, a group specializing in small-town anomalies, was called in to retrieve the SCP-3852-1 body and clean up the mess in the aftermath. Incidentally, a video of the carnage was somehow leaked onto the video-sharing website YouTube some years later, causing a containment fiasco for the Foundation. The investigation into the cameraman who filmed and presumably uploaded the video is ongoing and any information you may have into their identity should be reported to the nearest Foundation agent so that they can be properly terminated debriefed. SCP-3852 is an incredibly insidious anomaly, because even in the most desirable scenario possible, at least one person is doomed to die. In order for the town to be pacified and released from the anomalous effects of SCP-3852, the victim designated SCP-3852-2 must be neutralized. There simply appears to be no other way. When the village idiots are dispatched to a town in the thrall of SCP-3852, they are under strict instructions to execute the SCP-3852-2 individual as quickly as possible and distribute amnestics in order to avoid any additional or unnecessary bloodshed before collecting the SCP-3852-1 body and bringing it back for containment with the others at a secure Foundation site. Naturally, the SCP Foundation remains on the lookout for strange, hostile activity arising in small towns for fear that it could be another SCP-3852 incident unfolding. There is no way of predicting where the anomaly will strike next, given that anywhere with a population over 2,000 on the East Coast or in the Midwest is vulnerable to its influence. As such, it has been given the Keter class to reflect the challenges it poses to reliable containment. The fact that SCP-3852 seems to attack people with some prior history of accused crime does nothing to narrow down this roster either. After all, every small town, no matter how idyllic, holds dark secrets. SCP-3852 just provides a way to bring those secrets into the light. A satellite floats in the cold depths of space above our pale blue dot. It positions its targeting array down at a point thousands of miles below, and fires. Clack, clack, clack. A tired-looking man sitting in a coffee shop types away on his computer taking advantage of the free Wi-Fi to send off yet another job application. Nearby, a barista is writing down orders while a businessman takes a call between quiet sips of his mocha. A teenage girl texts her friend, giggling occasionally. An old man chews his bagel just a little too loudly for comfort. Nothing appears all that out of the ordinary. Until the blast hits. Intensity level 25. The job seeker notices a faint whisper in his ear. It startles him, and he turns to look around the coffee shop, but he can't spot who was whispering to him. How odd. He turns back to his keyboard and carries on typing, but a strange feeling hangs over him. This pervasive sense that something is very wrong. His eyes turn to the businessman, and he notices something. His phone is gone, but he's still loudly talking to someone. Someone who isn't there. The barista is smiling as she seems to note down orders, but in her notebook, She's scrawling the words, getting closer, again and again and again, and she doesn't have any idea why. The teenage girl, with shifty, furtive eyes, texts her friend a message saying, This is gonna sound crazy, but I feel like someone's watching me. As the job seeker tries in vain to fight the feelings of unease, he keeps hearing the old man chewing. Loud, incessant, cow-like chewing. It's really beginning to get on his nerves. Suddenly the thought crosses his mind that he'd actually like to kill this man. He'd like to squeeze his throat and break his jaw so that he could never chew like that again. The sudden appearance of this alien thought frightens him, and it's about to get so much worse. Intensity level 35. The job seeker starts to wonder if there's any point to this. He suspected that he'd been fired from his last job because nobody liked him. Did he really think he had a chance at getting this one? Really? What a stupid pipe dream. 
He's bombarded by thoughts like these that make typing more and more difficult. He notices that his hands are shaking. The chewing behind him is still so loud. He can't turn around. He knows on some level that if he does, he'll say something to the old man that he can't take back. The barista stares off into the distance, a haunted, contemplative look in her eye. The businessman gazes into his mocha like a crystal ball. The teenage girl begins to weep. The job seeker looks up when he notices something strange is happening outside. A middle-aged woman walking her dog suddenly clutches her chest like she's having a heart attack. She bends over and breathes deeply. Her dog barks at nothing, enraged by some invisible force that's all around them. Intensity level 50. Something's wrong. The voice in the job seeker's head is no longer a whisper. It's hissing and barking cruel words at him like, useless, worthless, lazy, disgusting, each one boring into his head like a power drill. But far more frightening than the voices themselves is the fact that he believes every single thing they're saying. He's lulled into a trance by their venomous rhythm. The only thing louder is that unending chewing. The waitress calmly walks back to the counter. She picks up a jug of blistering hot coffee and begins to swig directly from it. She can feel it sizzling in her mouth, and she couldn't care less. The businessman begins an intense screaming match with somebody who isn't there, snarling and practically foaming at the mouth. The job seeker can't take that chewing anymore. He turns to the old man, ready to unload on him. But when he opens his mouth to speak, nothing comes out. He sees that the bagel is gone, but the old man is still chewing. He smiles at him, red liquid streaking his lips and teeth. The job seeker looks down at the table and sees the outline of a fingerless hand under the old man's blood-soaked napkin. Intensity level 75. Inside the coffee shop, pandemonium breaks loose. The old man lies catatonic in his booth. The businessman fights a nearby wall, knuckles and toe bones cracking against the bricks. The waitress has the teenage girl in a headlock as the girl shrieks in agony and stabs at her assailant's leg with a table fork. The job seeker looks out the window at the violence suddenly unfolding on the street. Complete strangers are attacking each other with murderous intent, biting, gouging, punching, clawing, tearing, strangling. It all looks like… fun. He picks up his laptop and tosses it through the coffee shop window, shattering the glass, as if he was ever going to get that stupid job anyway. He steps through the broken window, a new man, and picks up a large jagged shard of broken glass, ready to join in on the festivities. Intensity Level Keter Thousands of people are changed. They do unimaginable things to each other and themselves. There is chaos in homes and out on the streets as everything collapses in a wave of terrible, unspeakable violence. Nothing will ever be the same. Thankfully, the horrors that you just observed were only part of a simulation, one created by the SCP Foundation and intended to demonstrate the worst-case scenarios of various anomalies on their roster. These events have not yet come to pass, but they very easily could if there was even a minor accident with the rogue anomalous satellite known as SCP-923. The SCP-923 satellite consists of a large parabolic dish made from unknown alloys, as well as a powerful internal reactor that produces massive quantities of energy and radiation, all to power the satellite's mysterious anomalous firing mechanism. 923 appears to select specific targets that it then fires a blast of energy at. Those in the proximity of the target when the beam hits are also affected, with the severity of the damage contingent on the intensity of the blast. Like many anomalies, its origins are shrouded in mystery. SCP-923 displays a degree of artificial intelligence and posts reports on its own condition and operations to the O5 Council Secured Information Relay Network, a classified communication network reserved for Foundation employees with Level 5 clearance. According to 923's own data, it was constructed in a Foundation research and development site. This is congruent with blueprints for a planned offensive satellite which was to be constructed at that very site but the project had actually been cancelled due to logistical concerns. The O5 Council deems it extremely important that SCP-923 never be made aware of this fact. Currently, since two-way lines of communication have been established, 923 obeys the orders of the O5 Council, not firing on a target unless given authorization by them. If it ever discovers that it technically isn't a Foundation construction, it runs the risk of going rogue and triggering some extremely dangerous outcomes, to say the least. SCP-923 was first discovered after it started a correspondence with the O5 Relay Network, posting a message that it had completed another successful termination, despite no such termination actually being ordered. Over the next several hours, this process continued as the 923 satellite sent in termination report after termination report, totaling 57 by the time it stopped. 
55 of which were later confirmed to be actual deaths, with the other two being deemed inconclusive. Adjustments have since been made to ensure that SCP-923 can't access any information on the network that hasn't been directly intended for it. SCP-923 is an extremely effective weapon. Depending on its operator's level of tolerance for collateral damage, it can completely reverse its orbit to detect and fire upon a target anywhere on Earth in a very short period of time. All it needs are the target's GPS coordinates, their altitude, the intended time of firing, and a selected level of intensity. This, incidentally, is where things get interesting with the tests the Foundation conducted. Naturally, they wanted to see the kind of firepower that each level of intensity was capable of, so D-classes were requested for live tests. The first test performed was at intensity level 10. However, this resulted in an error message, claiming that the 923 satellite isn't capable of firing at an intensity lower than level 23. In accordance with this new information, the Foundation planned the next test at intensity level 25. This time, the effects immediately took hold. The target and those nearby began to experience a degree of paranoid delusion. They would report hearing voices and be seen interacting with people who weren't there. They would experience a sense of crushing terror, impending doom, and also report the growing desire to cause harm to others. Most of all, in debriefing interviews, they would claim that they felt like they were being watched, though they refused to elaborate on what exactly they meant by that. Recovery time from this condition was measured at being between 15 and 19 days. Next came the test at intensity level 35. Everyone affected experienced symptoms similar to intensity level 25, except with powerful new self-destructive compulsions. The area of effect also grew with the increased power. Researchers who thought they were safe over 10 meters away collapsed to the ground in intense panic attacks. The effects were much longer on this setting too, and recovery from this intensity took 6 to 8 months. Interestingly, during the test there was a severe disruption to the audio-visual equipment. Some devices had been displaced, others were fused to the ground. The video footage was corrupted beyond use, but the audio retrieved displayed nothing out of the ordinary. However, when survivors of the test were asked to listen to the recorded audio, they claimed to once again hear the voices that were in their head that day and experience the terrible feelings and compulsions start up again. One of the researchers appended a note to the file which read, It looks like this thing actually has a blast effect to it and is not just a laser of madness. The audio and video feed disruptions are particularly interesting. From now on, researchers are to observe remotely, and D-class personnel are to be secured so they can't harm themselves. We need them alive for study. Next, the intensity was brought up to level 50, and the test was conducted once again. The results were once again similar to the previous one, but with far greater intensity and more pronounced physical effects on its victims. D-classes who were completely restrained still exhibited cuts and tears in their skin, and audio-visual recording equipment was displaced to an even greater degree than before. Victims of this intensity have not yet recovered, and Foundation researchers are not confident that they ever will. But the effects went further than just the people present. It appears that the area itself was subject to long-lasting effects. Staff who recovered the D-classes from the testing area reported an extreme sense of unease, claiming that the testing area simply felt wrong, but were unable to elaborate further. In spite of this, the tests continued to increase in intensity. Next, the level was increased to 75, and this is when things truly began to go off the rails. The satellite's target was rendered completely comatose, and the D-classes within 16 meters of him broke free from their restraints and began slaughtering each other with their bare hands. Disturbingly, many of the subjects, both living and dead, who were tested after the fact, seemed to bear wounds consistent with attacks by bladed weapons. None of the D-classes were armed, and the wounds seemed impossible to have been caused by mere fingers and teeth. There was an even greater displacement of recording devices, and some were missing after the test. The retrieved recordings caused even worse states of distress for those affected by the blast who were lucky enough to actually survive and could listen to them again. But it didn't end there. Anyone within 50 meters experienced intense panic attacks that often lasted longer than an hour. Observing researchers experienced what could best be described as a slightly more mild version of intensity level 25 symptoms. They reported hallucinations, things moving in the corners of their eyes, hearing voices, experiencing heightened paranoia and feelings of dread. There was even some poltergeist activity recorded, with objects seeming to move of their own accord. The lasting effects on the physical area are even more pronounced, with laser rangefinders indicating a level of permanent spatial distortion at the epicenter of the blast site. A researcher appended a note to this section of the file, reading, 
This is crossing a line from scientific to just barbaric. SCP-923 has said that its maximum output is 238, which it promptly converts to Keter intensity. Let's just see what this does and report our findings. However, the Keter level intensity proved to be too much to handle. So much so, that the entry on its test log begins with the sentence, it is strongly advised that this intensity never be used again. The blast induced psychosis permanently in every subject within a truly insane 2 kilometer radius, including a number of unfortunate researchers who severely underestimated the Keter level blast range. The site is now under permanent foundation protection as SCP-92302, due to the permanent effects the blast had on the landscape. A sense of panic is still felt from hundreds of meters away, and anyone who gets close enough to the center will experience full-blown psychosis just as much as those directly affected by the beam. Spatial and temporal anomalies abound in the area, and the O5 Council has deemed SCP-923 a risk in causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. But the most frightening part of all is yet to come. Every time the SCP-923 weapon is used, it causes a degree of internal damage to the satellite itself, raising the threshold of intensity that the weapon needs to even activate. It used to be that the satellite would fire at intensity level 23, but after extensive testing, its minimum intensity level is now 66. If the weapon is ever used again, it's only going to get worse. Despite this danger, SCP-923 has been classified as safe. But how is an object that is both out of Foundation control and able to operate with a dangerous degree of autonomy classified the same as harmless anomalies that require little to no containment procedures? The answer is buried in the question. The SCP Foundation cannot contain SCP-923, but seeing as there are currently over 7,500 active satellites orbiting planet Earth, 923 doesn't arouse much suspicion, especially with the Foundation cover story that it's merely a non-anomalous military satellite. The only continued containment effort required is making sure that other satellites do not enter its path of orbit to ensure that 923's advanced defense systems don't activate and destroy the interfering satellite, revealing its anomalous nature. Watch this, the teenage boy says before jumping his skateboard up onto the stair railing. His friends watch in amazement as he deftly guides his board down the long rail. They hoot and holler in support until suddenly the boy seems to lose his balance. He falls from the rail and tumbles down the stairs of the large parking garage where they had been practicing their skateboarding tricks. The boy hits the ground at the end of the stairs, and all of his friends go quiet. The boy is stunned, but eventually he opens his eyes and stands up, but none of his friends can do anything except stare. Oh no, oh no, oh no, the boy says as he looks down at his arm, which is now bent at a 90 degree angle in a spot where no joint should exist. The children watching all begin to scream and one, unsure of what else to do, turns and runs. What do I do? What do I do? The boy with the broken arm says to no one and everyone. Luckily, one of the group quickly collects herself and steps forward to take control of the situation. Come on, she says, we're getting you to the hospital. The girl puts her arm around him on his non-damaged side and helps him to the street, where they have a stroke of good luck. Parked just a block away is an ambulance. Hey, the girl cries out, waving towards the ambulance. The paramedics inside must have seen her, because the ambulance's lights immediately come on and it drives the short distance to them. The ambulance stops and two paramedics quickly exit the vehicle. The paramedics don't even need to ask what happened, they can obviously see from the unnatural angle of the boy's arm that he needs immediate medical attention, and they quickly place him into the back of the ambulance. The girl begins to pull herself into the back as well, but is quite forcefully shoved back into the street. Patience only is the sole response from the paramedic who pushed her before he slams the door shut. The girl gets a brief look at her friend's frightened face through the back window as the ambulance speeds away. Several days later, the children are sitting outside of the same parking structure, but none of them are in any mood to skate. All they can think about is their missing friend. Neither the boy's parents nor the police have any idea what happened to him or where he went. There's no records at any of the local hospitals of him ever being brought there nor does there seem to be any evidence of this particular ambulance having existed at all. No one even seems to believe the children that he got into an ambulance, the whole story just seems too far-fetched and outlandish, but the children know what they saw. As they discuss the events for the hundredth or perhaps thousandth time, one of the smallest of the group suddenly stands up and points. There it is! The rest of the group looks in the direction he's motioning and sees the same thing. It's the ambulance. None of them know what to do as the vehicle flies past them, this time with no lights on, and comes to a stop a block away from where they first spotted it. 
They watch as the two paramedics exit the vehicle and go around to the back. It's hard to see from this distance, but it looks as though they took something out of the rear of the ambulance, something that requires both of them to lift before dropping it on the sidewalk behind some trash cans. The children watch as the paramedics get back into the ambulance and drive away, disappearing just as quickly as they appeared. After a moment of shock, they all in unison begin running to the place where the ambulance stopped. They come to a skidding halt just in front of the trash cans. None of them can do anything except stare until they all break out into screams, one of the children turning and immediately running away. And they have good reason to scream, because in front of them is their friend. His arm is no longer broken, appearing to have been somehow repaired in just a matter of days, but it is also no longer attached to his shoulder. The boy opens his eyes as his friends scream and looks down to see that his arms and legs have been reattached at a new angle, jutting out from his back, leaving him standing on all fours, his face staring up at the sky like some kind of twisted animal. What happened to this young man was tragic, but he wasn't the first victim of this strange malicious anomaly, and unfortunately, neither would he be the last, because this was SCP-4419, also known as the Butcher's Chariot. SCP-4419 appears to be a seemingly normal vehicle which resembles a standard ambulance, though the exact make and model varies between manifestations. This anomalous ambulance will appear spontaneously in locations where a medical emergency of some kind is about to take place. Just how SCP-4419 is able to predict where and when these events will take place is unknown, nor is it understood how it always takes the form of an ambulance that resembles one appropriate to the local area. Once the medical event has occurred, whether that be a minor injury like a sprain or something more serious, such as a gunshot wound, SCP-4419 will quickly approach the injured individual. Two individuals which have a humanoid appearance and are dressed in paramedic uniforms that are, just like the ambulance, always appropriate to the location, will exit the ambulance. They will then secure the victim, using a stretcher if need be, and place them in the back of the ambulance. While the individuals who emerge from SCP-4419 will, for the most part, act as though they are normal medical professionals, they will strongly resist any attempt to either impede them in their quest to secure the injured person, as well as prevent anyone else except for their target from getting into the back of the SCP-4419 ambulance, up to and including the use of extreme physical force. As soon as the paramedic appearing individuals have managed to secure the victim in the back of the ambulance, it will then quickly leave the area at a high rate of speed, and research has shown that as soon as it is out of observation, SCP-4419 will demanifest along with whoever is inside. But this isn't the end of what this anomaly has in store for its victim. Between two and seven days later, the SCP-4419 ambulance will suddenly reappear at the same area where it picked up its victim. The same individuals will exit the ambulance and leave the victim somewhere nearby before getting back in the vehicle and leaving the scene once again. The victim who is left behind will always have suffered what can only be described as invasive bodily modifications. Their injuries are so extreme that in most cases they should have resulted in the death of the victim, and yet they will always somehow still be alive. While the exact form of modification will vary from victim to victim, there does appear to be some correlation between the original medical emergency and the resulting procedure. And the SCP Foundation has documented a number of encounters with SCP-4419 stretching all the way back to the early 1980s. Some notable examples include one from 1983, in which a pedestrian who was crossing the street was struck by an automobile, resulting in them breaking their leg. SCP-4419 was on site and quickly helped the man into the back of the ambulance. When he was returned several days later, all of his limbs had been reattached in such a way that they were protruding from the front of his torso. In another event which occurred in 1994, a man suffered a broken jaw in a fight outside of a bar. To no surprise, SCP-4419 was on hand and took the man away for treatment. When he was next seen, his jaw had been permanently forced open and a glass window had been installed in the back of his throat which permitted direct viewing of his heart which had also been moved to the back of the throat. Unfortunately, there was no way to reverse this procedure, and the man had to be euthanized. In 2003, a husband and wife were in a car accident where they each sustained multiple broken bones. When SCP-4419 dropped them back off, the two had been fused together at the back, and any bones that were broken in the crash had been removed completely. When an elderly gentleman had a heart attack in 2006, he was picked up by SCP-4419 and returned with 11 new, non-functioning hearts grafted inside of his body. 
attempts were made to remove these additional hearts through surgery, but unfortunately, the man did not survive the procedure. In 2008, a structure fire resulted in 19 people suffering extreme burns. Seven more injuries came when a crowd attempted to stop the SCP-4419 paramedics from placing all of the victims in the back of the ambulance, but they were unsuccessful in preventing them from leaving the scene with them. When the group of victims was finally returned, it was as a single organism, a large, solitary mass which twitches and shivers when physical contact is applied. No method for euthanizing this organism has been able to be found, and currently they are stored inside of a tank at Site-31. In perhaps the strangest sighting of SCP-4419, a US private was wounded while on patrol in Afghanistan, and a military medical evacuation vehicle arrived to evacuate him. Suspicious about the vehicle's sudden appearance and the forceful conduct of the medical staff, the private's fellow soldiers ended up opening fire on the vehicle. They reported seeing a viscous black fluid leaking from the vehicle's surface, but they were unable to stop it from taking the injured private. In a deviation from its normal behavior, the victim was not returned to the same place, and instead appeared in the barracks the next day. The victim had been broken down into a thin paste and was spread across the walls. Agents were dispatched to secure what was left of the man, and they reported finding a still intact eyeball that dilated when they approached. The collected viscera has been labeled as remains and placed in storage, but it is currently unknown whether or not the victim has truly expired. Due to the danger SCP-4419 presents to anyone who suffers an injury, as well as its ability to appear virtually anywhere on the planet, it has been classified as Keter. Containment efforts at this point are largely focused on maintaining information control and post-manifestation cleanup, as opposed to any attempts at physical confinement. Anyone who witnesses an SCP-4419 manifestation is to be administered amnestics, and victims are to be treated in order to restore them to their original physical state as much as possible, or euthanized when no viable medical treatments are available, with a cover story constructed in order to explain their death. SCP-4419 is one of the most cruel and sadistic anomalies in the SCP Foundation's database, ranking right up there with SCP-106, The Old Man. Hopefully one day we will find a means to contain this brutal so-called medical vehicle, but until then, be careful if you suffer an injury and an ambulance is suddenly on hand, you might come back changed in ways you never thought possible. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, People struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog, if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted, even on the quietest of nights, but lately, there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge, particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. 
So, even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow, towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular, but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London, the first of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be. Could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and, in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then, sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. 
With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand, but there's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also clearly no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content, but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. 
Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting King of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the King of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. 
SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. Honestly, no. It doesn't feel like anything is working, the woman tells the man who is seated across the room from her. She's been coming to see him for several months now, but she doesn't feel like she's made progress on any of her issues. The man listens and nods as he jots down some notes on his pad of paper. He has something he wants to discuss with her. She may feel as though she's run out of options, but there is one other thing they could try. He's seen lots of success using this with his other patients, though it's a technique that many would deem to be rather… unconventional. The woman is unsure. Unconventional techniques don't exactly instill her with confidence. But at this point, what did she have to lose? The man stands up and motions for the woman to follow him. He leads her out of his office to a section of his practice that she's never seen before, where they stop in front of a closed door. On the door is a window covered by a curtain, and she notices that there are a set of strong locks as well. He unlocks the door and ushers her inside, where she finds that it is a small room, maybe ten feet across at most, with thick padding on the floor and walls, and bright white lights set into the ceiling. He tells her to wait there just a moment and to make herself comfortable before he excuses himself. The woman looks around at the padded room, wondering just what it is that she's agreed to. The man returns, and now he's holding something. A garment bag. He unzips it to reveal a dark piece of clothing inside, but when he takes it out, she sees now that it isn't clothing at all, at least not any normal kind. It's a straitjacket. The woman is scared, unsure if she wants to go through with this, and he does his best to put her at ease. If she's uncomfortable, she certainly doesn't have to do anything she doesn't want to but he reiterates that he has had great results using this with some of his other patients. It's been something of a miracle cure. Well, no, cure is the wrong word. He corrects himself and explains that this won't cure her in the way that she's probably thinking, but rather, what he's found is that this therapy is able to provide a momentary relief from symptoms, a chance to see what life is like without being plagued by the issues that have led her to seek his help. Once she has gotten a glimpse at what life is like without these burdens, they can work towards bringing her back to that point through other therapies and techniques. This might be just the breakthrough she needs to finally make something work. The woman is still skeptical, but she is desperate to find anything that will help her escape the thoughts constantly plaguing her mind so that she can get back to being the person she wants to be. And after a moment of thought, she agrees to go through with the procedure. The therapist tells the woman to hold her arms out in front of her and places the straitjacket on her. She can see and feel now that it is made of black leather, and it fits her perfectly, almost as if it were made just for her. She turns around, and he pulls the straps tight before fastening them in place. The woman, standing in a small padded room and fully constrained by the black leather straitjacket, turns to the man and asks, Now what? Now we wait, he tells her, before backing out of the room. A warning, though. Now a warning, she says. This is a one-off procedure, you can only do it once, he tells her before closing the door. She's confused. Is this the procedure? He's locking her in a cell? What is going on? She never should have agreed to this. Her mind starts to race, filling with bad thoughts, and they get even worse when the lights suddenly go out. She starts to panic, breathing heavily in the dark from both fear and from being constricted by the leather straitjacket. She calls out that she has changed her mind. She doesn't want to do this after all. No response. She's serious. She wants to end this right now and leave the room. It isn't working, it's actually making her feel worse. All the fears and anxieties that plague nearly every moment of her life come rushing in at once. Her mind races as she can feel all the telltale signs of a panic attack starting, a million little issues pulling her apart at the seams, leaving her stretched out and helpless to do anything to stop it. But then suddenly, there's a change. Like a cool breeze blowing across her face, the feelings of hopelessness and despair start to dissipate. Her anxieties feel as though they are melting away into the dark leaving her with only the comforting embrace of the straitjacket. It isn't that she feels happy, necessarily. She simply feels… normal, content with herself and her situation. It's an incredible feeling, and she basks in the joy of not feeling bad. 
She doesn't know how long she's in the dark room feeling content. Minutes? Maybe hours? But eventually the door opens and the lights come on. Her session is over. She leaves the office with a new perspective on life. Most of the feelings of satisfaction have gone away already, but still she feels renewed, ready to tackle her issues so she can feel what she felt in the straitjacket again, so she can feel normal. By the next day, though, her new lease on life is completely gone, and she is on the phone with the man pleading with him to let her come in immediately and wear the straitjacket again. He warned her, though, that it was a one-off procedure. Too much exposure is dangerous. She needs to focus on other treatments instead. The woman only wants to come wear it for a little bit, though, just a few minutes to feel that way again. He tells her it's impossible, though. She should be happy it was so successful and move on to new techniques. And besides, he's leaving for a conference and won't be back for a week. They can discuss things again when he gets back. It's raining that night as a figure in a dark coat breaks the glass on the front door and reaches through to unlock the door. The woman enters the office and hangs her wet jacket on the wall. Her flashlight illuminates the room they have their sessions in. No one is there. She walks deeper into the building and spots the door to the padded room. She passes by and goes even further to a back room that she's never been in before. In the room, against a wall, is a metal trunk. She opens it to find the dark garment bag with the leather straitjacket inside. What do you want me to do again? The young man asks. He was just supposed to be delivering a pizza, and his boss would be angry to learn that he allowed a customer to invite him in. This is my office, she tells him, and I'm working on some new techniques for my patients, but I need to try them out myself first. That makes sense, right? Well, uh, sure, I guess, he responds. But for this particular one, I need some help. It's a secret, though, so I can't get any of my colleagues to help me. But you can help me, right? The young man nervously swallows the soda she's given him and nods in agreement. She explains that all he has to do is help her tighten the straitjacket, close the door, turn off the lights, and listen. In a little while, when she's finished, she'll ask him to come inside and take it off her. That's it. The young man still seems a little wary of the request. What happened to your door? He asks, but she ignores his question and pushes a wad of cash into his hand. The young man shuts the door to the padded cell, and a moment later, the lights go out. The woman is almost immediately taken back to the same mental place she was before. All of the thoughts that constantly repeat in her mind, the ones that she's never able to turn off, suddenly go quiet. She sighs with relief in her dark, safe space. But then, she feels something. Not in her mind, but on her face. A twitch, just a little facial spasm. But then another. There's something wrong. Her face suddenly feels very tight, like it's being stretched. Her eyes grow wide. Her mouth pulls into an unintentional sneer. The young man hears the woman's muffled cries from inside the room and opens the door. But what he sees causes him to emit his own scream before he turns and runs out of the office into the stormy night. What the heck? The man thinks as he looks at the broken window on his office door. He enters to see that the door is still unlocked and that there's glass on the floor inside. He walks inside his office and looks around and doesn't see anything. But in an instant, there's a moment of realization. He runs to the back, to the door to the padded cell. The door to the room is ajar, and he listens. Is that breathing inside? He opens the door to the dark cell and turns on the light. The black leather straitjacket is sitting in the middle of the floor, except it isn't the floor anymore. Now, instead, a stretched layer of skin is spread across the padded room, with the outline of flattened bones visible underneath. The man's mind can't comprehend what it is that he's looking at, but then he sees it. In the far corner of the room, is the stretched out face of the woman, her eyelids pulled too tight to blink, leaving her eyes staring up at him. Through a stretched, contorted mouth, she whispers, Help me. Is there anything crueler than an object that is able to treat your mental health issues, yet has some of the most devastating side effects imaginable? In this humble doctor's opinion, no. And today's anomaly is just such an object. Designated SCP-482, it is perhaps better known as the Mentally Mutating Straitjacket. SCP-482 is a black leather straitjacket that is quite similar in appearance and construction to a mass-produced version, though as you'll see, it is completely unique. Although the straitjacket is comparable in size to other medium-sized versions, it is somehow able to fit virtually any and all body types and sizes. A tag inside contains the words, Made in Xiaoyan, hand wash only, no acerahena powder, in faded text, though neither the city nor Acerahena powder appear to exist in any records that the SCP Foundation has been able to locate. 
There are no signs of wear on SCP-482, but there are several cuts on the straps that cinch the garment closed, and testing has shown that it is able to be further damaged, though any additional investigations of the extent to which it can be damaged have been suspended due to the lack of viable duplicates. The real anomalous effects of SCP-482 occur when the straitjacket is worn, and the two main effects, which occur one after the other, have been designated as Time Point Alpha and Time Point Beta. Time Point Alpha is used to refer to the initial stage of a subject wearing SCP-482 and can last a varied period of time, though it is most often between 1 and 6 hours of wear. During this period, the subject will report feeling mentally better, and any negative mental afflictions that they suffer from or are forced to deal with will appear to disappear completely. Additionally, any medications that they may be on will have their effects negated entirely, leading to them returning a result on Foundation standard psychological tests that is consistent with a baseline mentally stable individual. The effects of Time Point Alpha are temporary, and once the subject is separated from SCP-482, any mental illnesses they are living with will be seen to return, though they will disappear once more if the straitjacket is worn again. However, the amount of time a subject spends experiencing the effects of Time Point Alpha are cumulative, and given enough time inside of the straitjacket, they will always eventually reach the second stage of SCP-482. Time Point Beta refers to the subsequent time period that passes if a subject is still wearing SCP-482 once Time Point Alpha lapses. During this period, the changes to the subject will no longer be mental, and instead, they will begin to experience physical effects. The exact nature of the physical changes will vary, though they do seem to be related in some way to the subject's own mental health issue, with the degree of the change also seemingly related to the severity of their issue. Through the testing of SCP-482 by Foundation researchers on D-Class personnel, a number of different manifestations of the straitjacket's anomalous effects have been documented, and they're recorded in a file designated Experiment Log SCP-482. In the first test, a male D-Class diagnosed with schizophrenia was placed inside of the leather straitjacket. He immediately reported feeling eerily calm, and he was observed to simply sit and stare at the wall with a blank expression for 2 hours and 49 minutes, a period which was later determined to be his Time Point Alpha. Time Point Beta began one minute later at 2 hours and 50 minutes when the subject's body began to contort, and he remarked that he was in a great deal of pain. Various parts of the subject's body began to increase in mass and size, including his head, as his eyes began to bulge out. He called in agony while attempting to make eye contact with the researchers who were observing through a glass viewing window for 34 minutes until a termination order was given. Subsequent examination of the subject's body revealed that his body mass had increased by roughly 180% due to rapid bone and muscle growth. It's unclear what physical process caused this, though genetic tests showed that his DNA had abnormally shortened telomere strands. The observers also reported they experienced an unnatural feeling that rendered them unable to move in a normal manner while the subject was making eye contact with them. For the second test, another male D-Class, though one who had been diagnosed with a paranoid personality disorder, was placed in the straitjacket. During his alpha exposure, he reported a satisfying quiet in his head, with none of the disembodied voices that normally plagued his thoughts speaking to him. He still appeared content after two hours and was taken out of the suit, though after requesting to be placed back inside, he was allowed to return to wearing SCP-482. After an additional one hour and thirty minutes, though, the beta exposure began. Visible bulges appeared on his neck and shoulders, and after four minutes, he began screaming for someone to stop talking and get out of his head. More bulges appeared on his body, and audio recording equipment in the room picked up mysterious sounds that analysis has revealed to have been as many as seven distinct voices speaking in an unknown language. The termination order was issued 25 minutes later, and a later autopsy revealed that each bulge actually contained a fully formed mouth and voice box. Observing researchers also reported that during the test, they had seen flashes of movement in their peripheral vision. A subsequent review of the tape footage revealed small shadows appearing and disappearing in the room throughout the test. Next up was a female D-Class who had been diagnosed with hyperphagia, which is a disorder that can cause an extreme increase in appetite and can remove the ability to satiate one's hunger. Upon being placed in SCP-482, she remarked that, for the first time ever, I am actually full. She felt this way for an hour and 58 minutes, after which she began to feel a pain in her abdomen. The D-Class fell into the fetal position as the pain increased, and her limbs were observed to begin retracting into her body, accompanied by loud snapping sounds as presumably the bones started to crack and break. Oh god, it's eating me! Oh god, it hurts! She cried out, 
and a termination order was immediately issued. The autopsy that followed revealed that the woman's body had somehow formed a second digestive system that had begun to consume her own body mass, and if left unchecked, would have eventually digested it in its entirety. Following this test, the observing researchers reported that they were unable to satisfy their own hunger cravings with normal amounts of food, and several of them actually had to be restrained by security staff in the on-site cafeteria. Luckily, these urges appeared to fade after several days. In the final test, a D-class personnel with pyromania was placed in SCP-482. Despite the impulse control disorder normally causing them to start fires whenever given the chance, they now ignored all of the flammable materials offered to them by researchers. After one hour and 33 minutes, though, thermometers in the testing room noted a sudden sharp rise in temperature. This was followed by a powerful explosion of heat and flames when the D-class spontaneously ignited. The testing room was completely destroyed, and nearby hallway A13 suffered catastrophic damage. All observing researchers were also lost in the conflagration. SCP-482, though, survived. Surprisingly, the body of the D-class was also able to be recovered and though the autopsy was made difficult due to the heat it still exuded, a discovery was made. Inside the body, a new organ was found, one that appeared to be sustaining some type of constant reaction that produced heat, as well as strong magnetic waves, and this organ has been placed in containment for future study. SCP-482 is currently being kept in a containment locker at a secure site, with access restricted to level 2 personnel and above. The maximum time allowed for testing is one hour after mutations manifest, and any test subjects who reach time point beta are to be terminated. Following termination, SCP-482 is to be removed from their body prior to autopsy. The straitjacket is then to be thermally cleansed and all biological traces of the prior subject removed before it is used for testing again. Now I bet you are telling yourself, well this sounds pretty easy to contain, I bet this is a safe class anomaly, and normally I would agree with you but perhaps you noticed something strange in the experiment log. Did you pay attention to the reports from observing researchers that they too had begun to experience some rather unusual effects simply from watching SCP-482 affect a subject? Did it seem to you as though the mentally mutating straitjacket was somehow projecting the mental illnesses experienced by the subjects onto those observing it? It appears that there may be more to SCP-482 than first meets the eye. And this mystery only deepens when one reads the containment procedures on this anomaly's file and realizes that the person overseeing SCP-482 research is none other than SCP Foundation legend Dr. Bright. Is the actual testing of SCP-482 not actually taking place on the D-Class personnel but on the SCP Foundation researchers? A convoluted experiment designed to discover the true extent of its anomalous effects. When it comes to this Euclid-class anomaly, only Dr. Bright knows for sure. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-767, Crime Scene Photographs, for another inanimate object that appears to actually be quite active. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.